This is another video in how to create generative art. This is part two of two videos on arrays. If you haven't watched the first video on arrays, the basics, go watch that first and then come here. In this video, we'll be looking at specific examples of how I've used arrays in my generative art. Let's get started on that. Three of these are animated, this one, this one, and this one. And so for all three of those, I'm using that technique of pushing things into the array, taking things out of the array, having two different arrays, and replacing one with the other. This is Floral Fusion. Let me run that so you can see the animation. This project was a collaboration with Nomadic Frame, a photographer. And besides the animation uh, array, there's also another array used in this, which is loading the images, the photographs. So if you look on the side here, I've got all the photos from Nomadic Frame, and I've labeled them all. Uh, this is Nomadic 7, Nomadic 8, Nomadic 9. When you load images, you should load them in preload so that they'll all be in memory when you get into setup and draw. So in the preload, if I were loading one of these images, I would say IMG equals load image, and I'd name the image that is right here. Well, I wanted to load all of these images. I didn't want to have to name every image. So that's why I've got all of these using the same name, but just with a new number. So when I do the preload, I do a for loop and I go through all of the images, the number of images I have, and I put those images into an array of images. So I've got IMG I, and then later on when I'm pulling the images, I can just call IMG 14 and it'll pull this JPEG. So that's a way of using an array to keep track of a bunch of images. Then I have this project called Collisions Art Plus Physics. In this project, besides being animated, every one of these blocks is its own canvas, its own buffer canvas. So if you look over here, I've got an array of canvases that I'm initiating here. And as I make a new block, I'm keeping a counter here and the count is going in here. So canv count equals create graphics width comma height. And the width comma height is just very small. So in this case, I'm not pushing things into the array. I'm just naming the items in the array. So the first item is going to be canv0 equals create graphics. And the second item is going to be canv1 equals create graphics. So then in the draw function, I go through all of the items in the array. And for each item, I use image canv z. Z is the number in the for loop. Uh, to place the items in the correct place in the canvas. This project is called Cheery Quilts, and it has different sized grid spots or tiles. So this is a two by two tile, and this is a one by one tile, and somewhere in here there's a three by three tile. So first I place my three by three tile in a random position, and then I place my two by two tiles in random positions. And then I finish by placing the one by one tiles in their positions. But I have to keep track of where I'm placing these two by two tiles so that I'm not placing two by two tiles on top of each other. And in order to keep track, I have to put the positions of those tiles that I'm placing into an array. So to keep track of that, each grid space is going to have either a zero or a one in the array. If it has a zero, then it's an empty space. If it has a one, that means that space is occupied. The array is called grid. I start off by filling all of the spaces in the array with a zero. Then I place my three by three tile. I'm going to skip that because it's a little more complicated. Let's get to the two by two tiles. So I'm going to have 30 attempts to put my two by two tiles. I'm not going to wind up with 30 tiles because some of them are not going to be able to be placed. But I pick a random X position and Y position, and then I come up with a position number for where that X and Y position is. So I've got X1 
plus y1 times the number across. So if I pick something on the second row, the third column, and I have 20 items across, then that's going to be position number 23. So it's going to be 1 times 20 plus 3. And that's going to be 23 here. So then I have an if statement. I'm going to look at that position 23, and I'm going to check, is that equal to 0? But I've got three other spaces that that 2 by 2 tile takes up. So I'm also going to check that position plus 1, the one to the right. I'm also going to check that position plus num across, which is 1 down. And I'm going to check that position num across plus 1, which is 1 down and 1 over. So if all four of those positions have zeros in the array, then and only then will I place the 2x2 two two tile. So if I do place a 2x2 two two tile, then I have to replace all of those positions, all of those array spots with ones. So they go from zeros to being ones. And then the next attempt at a 2x2 two two tile, maybe it overlaps this tile, but there's going to be a one in there, so there's not going to be a tile that overlaps. And then once all the 2x2 two two tiles are placed, then I can just go through the grid one by one and check does that spot have a zero or a one if it has a zero then i can place a tile there so that's how the different size tile pieces work with cheery quilts and that's also how the different size tiles work with the order of things there's also with cheery quilts another array and this is for my color table um, i was selling this on a platform that wouldn't take csv files so I had to convert my CSV color table into an array of palettes, which you can see here. To do this quickly, I used ChatGPT. I just uh, copy-pasted the entire thing into ChatGPT and told it to please uh, convert this to an array. And I had to give it some instructions to get it right, but when I was satisfied, I copy-pasted into my code. I'll show you one more example of an array. This is a quad grid maker. The array here is called points. And for this, uh, it starts off just as a regular grid. If I change this tile vary to zero, you'll see that it's a normal grid. But if I vary this by, say, five, then it starts to get a little wonky. And I can vary this by 15, and it gets more wonky. So since I'm doing quadrilaterals, and a quadrilateral has four points, four x, y positions, and all of these have to be connected to each other. That means I have to remember where the points are for the previous quadrilateral, right? So I've drawn this quadrilateral, which has these two points at the bottom. That means that for this quadrilateral, I know that the points at the top left and top right have to be here and here. So I have to keep track of all of those points in an array. So I start by making points here and going across, and I'm not drawing any quadrilaterals yet. And I finish this point, then I come over to here. I still haven't drawn any quadrilaterals. Then I get here, and once I'm here, now I can draw the first quadrilateral. So I draw that quadrilateral, then I go here, now I can draw this quadrilateral, and so forth. So as I'm going through the X and Y positions, I'm pushing those X and Y positions into the array. So as I'm adding the points, I'm keeping track of what location I'm at with points.length minus one. Uh, the position that I'm at at the moment is not points.length because if I have 10 items in the array, then I'm at position nine because it starts at position zero. So I put whatever the number position I'm at into this variable POS for position. And then I'm making my quadrilateral uh, based on that position. So I've got pause 0, pause 1. That's the X and the Y. So this is a nested array in this case. So if I was right here, this would be pause 0, 1. And then pause minus 1 would be right here. And then pause minus num across minus 2 is going to be up here and over here. 
and then pause minus num across minus one is going to be here. So I go here, 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 and here. I'm going to share a link to this example in the video description as well. I'm doing the editing and I realized I wanted to add a couple of things. There are a bunch of other functions that I haven't talked about. Uh, some of them are native to JavaScript and I will leave a link to this page showing all of these functions and then on the P5 reference page there's also a bunch of P5 array functions. So that's it for arrays. In the next video, we're going to be looking at sine and cosine and other trigonomic functions, which can be used to make wonky circles and draw a meandering line across the canvas. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can leave those in the video comments. Uh, you can also post to my Discord and you can post art to my Discord. If you like this video, you can give it a like, consider subscribing to the channel, and ring the bell for notifications. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.